The received idea that the things we need are designed by remote specialists and made remotely by others is under challenge. The new possibility is for objects to be formed locally on demand using digital data about form and applying that to suitable 3D media in a process of one-off fabrication. It raises huge questions about how we organise our society. It not only makes a nonsense of massive factories, potentially, um, where does it leave designers? One answer seems to be that it puts them closer to the people for whom they are designing. Another is that it does away with them altogether and allows us the chance to design our own things. The tools that we have now are not only um, hammers and chisels, they're also communication tools. And I think the big element in, in this kind of mini revolution is, is celebrating communication in different ways. And um, there are many questions, but one for me today is, is it a game or a real benefit? I think it's a real benefit, but some part of it is a game. I will show the 501 chair, a chair that was optimized using digital tools, uh, stress analysis, to reduce material and become a bit more maybe clever in terms of structure and support. And the sofa on a larger scale, again, can support a family by maybe using only the essential bits. So maybe you can say that in this object, the redundant elements were removed. Now, uh, the OMI MGX was one of the first products to be produced straight from the SLS tank to the masses. So the OMI was the first time for me to think about the user as, as an input. This is a flexible structure that allows you to modify it in a certain way, but manually modifying, not virtually modifying. And by fixing it in different positions, you can, again, I believe you can add your personal values to your little kind of decorative object. Object DNA is about materialization of objects in the best way. So if you think about designing in 3D and using code as a virtual object, then this object goes to mat through materialization, become a, a real object within several hours. What was very interesting about this technique here is that we could sign off a virtual object and say, this will come to life with no uh, faults. And it's not FEA, if you know, uh, finite, finite elements an analysis. It is FEA in reverse. So rather than uh, designing and analyzing, we are, we created a software that allows you, using some artificial intelligence, to select points on the object and add stress tags to it, meaning loads, okay? So we can say, we will apply 120 kilo on the seat, 15 on the back, and the AI just take all that sea of information and generate the necessary support. We are reducing the material usage by calculating the necessary support. And in this experiment, we use a third amount of the anticipated material usage. So here we, we played with the notion of softness, virtual softness. How can we simulate softness, analyze softness, predict softness in, in the virtual environment? The AI light, we used the AI here to record user uh, motion and behaviors in space and translating it into forms. So, and it is important because I, I believe that we, well, in the future we'll study the users through different ways and harness and use the user behavior patterns to generate better products. So at the moment, this is again, this is a bit more decorative and funny, but what I'm trying to show here is that this is a brain, so the object has a brain and you can see the green there's a, a series of codes that is being generated like a heartbeat, like a pulse, and each code is being translated to a form. So this object is actually kind of a mimic, so it's a reflection of, 
of you. When I started digital forming, the, the concept was to allow users to shape, modify, and interact with objects, but within a set of boundaries. What we developed is the concept of Odo and Codo. It's original design object and co-designed object. And using a set of software, we, can, we have a two-side type of application, where one side is the Odo, where the designer takes his objects, his products, using parts and different elements, and set up boundaries and say, okay, this would be open, but only up to a certain amount. It is about a point cloud. So we treat objects as points in space. It's, it is like a, a DNA because we, we can say this group of points will move, this will not move, they will drag the neighbors, these will behave a bit they will, uh, softly and so on. And it's coming from the idea of uh, each one of us are the one and only. Each one of us has his own center of you know, body weights and uh, you know, the head is a bit smaller or shorter. We have uh, different tools so we can create patterns that are changing on the surface. So there are many opportunities there. It's not only about um, the user interaction, it's also about the way you make things. So the designer des designed the, the product but also the experience. So the designer might say, it is only an assembly of pre-designed parts or it is open for shape modifying and, and then, you know, this is going back to the question of how much. Is it 50-50 or 90-10? So I might say, I'm only giving 10% of openness to the user. Because it's not only about, um, you know, generating products. It's also about uh, progress in terms of the way we make things. So big news for the um, sustainability and the green movements here as well. Because this is air until someone pays for it. I'm, I'm trying to keep these objects virtual for as long as we can, um, because obviously there is no waste, there is no storage, well, minimum storage at least. There is minimum shipping, um, there is no more boats and, and planes coming from China. So you can imagine Europe become a farm for these production spaces, and these production spaces are at the moment cubicle. So what we are developing now is a way to target products into these redundant machine spaces. So we can give you a quote saying, okay, you are walking from London, you can uh, get your object three weeks from Tottenham Court Road or three days from Paris. Passive studying, it's a notion of, there is no real-time interaction with objects, but objects that study you on a service. It's like an incubation, it's a virtual incubation of products. So what we're doing here is that we use uh, sensors under your foot to measure your pressure distribution. It's a shoe that studies you. So while you walk, it will study you through these uh, pressure distribution points and uh, collect your personal data and keep it very safe. So it's, only, it's for your eyes only, uh, but it will be streamed into the server, into the cloud, where your next better shoe will wait for you. It's a notion of what we can do with personal information. I know it's a, it's a very sensitive thing, but you can suddenly see that these objects can be connected to you in, in many different ways and study you and, and offer themselves. So the product design is there, but you know, there's an element of growth and, and, and uh, development. The products are undoubtedly designed by computer. They were, you know, there was no beauty from craft that you would get from Japanese pottery or luthuri or something like that. And, um, you know, we're used to form following function. I saw no function. Um, and form following fabrication. Um, and there, there, there's no evidence of that as well. You know, too often we find that form follows focus groups and people's opinions, opinion formers. And, um, but undoubtedly, it's gonna be form follows funding. Um, and uh, it has to be form follows future and is it going to be sustainable? And where is the future going to take us? Are these devices going to be able to do it finer, cheaper, faster, better? Um, and is it transient technology? Undoubtedly, it's not. Um, it's, uh, you know, as a product designer, I'm looking at it and I'm thinking, wow, 
it allows me to do things I could never do before. It gives me a great deal of freedom. Um, but this freedom comes at a price. And, you know, when the uh, graphic design was a craft activity and you had to draw the letters and you had to really know about tra- typography, we were only uh, assailed by professional graphics. But now it means that any- anyone has that power to create. And we've seen since computer-aided design has appeared, actually there's a huge upswing in demand for good design in the marketplace because people understand it better. The customizable point, number one, firstly, um, Nespresso, part of Nestle Group, discovered this online community of people who were um, customizing their coffee machines. So taking off the back um, and reconnecting the pipes and making their coffee hotter or frothier or, or whatever it was, and then sharing their designs uh, online with other people. And this is exactly the same thing that happened with Lego Mindstorms. Those of you who are familiar with that, um, people um, hacked into the, the code of Lego robots about 10 years ago uh, and actually innovated on the code and made the robots do completely new things that Lego had never dreamt of in the first place. Uh, in both of these cases, Lego or Nestle could have tried to sue these people for infringement of copyright, but actually, in the case of Lego, Mindstorms became their most successful product of all time. Uh, so I think that this stuff has real commercial potential as well. I just want to go on to this point about ownership. I tend to think that ideas are worthless because there's lots of them and that we never have a shortage of ideas. What we lack are um, things with momentum and, uh, and, and people with a desire to, to realise them. And I increasingly think that uh, our network of uh, relationships is as valuable as... Uh, the knowledge that we have. So this whole idea of ownership is, um, uh, is an interesting one. And I personally think that ideas always benefit from uh, iteration, socialization, and, and um, uh, combination. So the more sociable you can make uh, this process, the better. Just to give an idea of where the technologies are at the moment, um, laser-centered parts, the, the sort of which are on the table at the moment, are being used um, in aircraft at the moment. They're routinely used by companies um, and they've been flight certified for many years. It takes a lot of work to get there, um, and it's not something that can be done in someone's uh, garage just like that at the moment, but you know, it has reached a pretty good state of maturity w- with a lot of work. A lot of the time, people see these technologies and get the idea, you can make anything. I, I was on a TV program many years ago where they were trying to convince me to say, yes, I could scan a car here, email it to Australia, and print up that car and drive off in it. You know, uh, whoa, whoa, whoa. We're nowhere near that. I honestly don't think we'll ever be at that stage, but I I desperately hope I'm wrong. Um, But we're working in that kind of direction. And as I say, we are putting parts routinely on aircraft already. Um, Another big issue is the the machines are expensive, but that's beginning to change. And particularly, if we think about the materials at the moment, the material that that these parts on the table here, um, the cost of that material is about 100 times that of the same material if if you injection mould it. Okay, and that naturally puts people off. Okay, however, that's beginning to change. A lot of large um, materials suppliers are beginning to see that this technology is going to be used for manufacturing and for high volume manufacturing. That is going to happen. And so, therefore, they can see that they're going to start making some money out of it. And so, they're starting to invest. Um, so, it's happening, it's, it's, it's evolving, um, but it's going to take time. One thing to consider on the cost. Okay, the material costs 100 times what it does to, for example, have the injection molding material. But what we can do with these technologies is make uh, geometries that are otherwise impossible and that have value that far surpass what we can currently make. As an example, Boeing have done this where they uh, take what used to be a number of different parts stuck together and make them all in one piece. Okay, it costs no less. In fact, it costs more to manufacture the the components with the new technology than the old. So why use it? Well, the answer is that if you can manufacture 10 pieces all in one, it makes the maintenance cost much lower, much cheaper. And over the lifetime of the aircraft, it becomes, you know, the value is encapsulated in the complexity of the geometry. We need to really look at where we can make value uh, count. And it's in the intrinsic design, stuff that Asa is talking about here, where we can really do that. And by bringing the design capability and the manufacturing capability together, I think we have a really powerful tool, and, and the UK is actually very well equipped to, to capitalise this on, on both aspects. Your belief that not everyone can be a designer 
and Roland said that anyone has the power to create. So there's a conflict in there. I just wonder about this business of giving 10% to the user um, when it may not be yours to give in the end. This is a very uh, professional process. Um, and it's a very professional technology. We are not coming from the do-it-yourself. We're coming from the design approach, uh, where a designer designs an object, but we'll also design the experience.